Ah, yes, the magnificent Trolley Sourbright Crawler, also known as Trollicus brightolus. The worm's captivating neon colour makes it an easy gummy prey. Trolley! It's a surprisingly sour, invitingly chewy, staggeringly snackable species unlike anything else found on this planet. Eat me! Delicious. Visit trolley.com to shop now. Trolley, eat me! <laughs> Manchester's indie rock and roll station, XS Manchester. The XS Manchester Long Player, an iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. XS Manchester. Hello there, it's been a while, so thank you very much for coming back to the XS Long Player to hear another story about another classic album. We're going back to 2003 today and the Australian rock band Jets' debut album, Get Born. Recorded in Sunset Studios, Los Angeles. I wonder why I did an American accent, but I resisted doing an Australian accent. But anyway, it also contains such songs as Are You Gonna Be My Girl, Roll Over DJ, Look What You've Done, Get Me Out of Here, Cold Hard Bitch. It's essentially wall-to-wall bangers. Nick Sester from Jet is going to talk us through it today, sharing his memories and stories from the making of this platinum certified album which you can listen to in full if you head to the show notes for this podcast you can find a link to listen back to the whole album dead simple in spotify just click it but let's get stuck in nick sester from jet talking about get born nick lovely to have you on the excess long player how you doing i'm doing pretty good how about you Yeah, really good, thanks. So we're today looking back at the release of Get Born, which happens to coincide with the 20th anniversary tour, which is happening this year. So you're celebrating the release of this album yourself. Out of curiosity, did the double decade catch you off guard? Does it feel like, as it's been part of your life for 20 years, does it feel like it has been 20 years? Um, I never thought about it, but I mean, it's not been, I mean, Jet as a a thing has not been part of my or Mm. our lives for such a long time anyway. So I do feel like I'm reconnecting with an old part of myself is perhaps the best way to put it. Do you look back and do you recognise the person who wrote those songs? Now you're reconnecting with it and you're 20 years down the line. Do you look back and do you still feel those connections with the record that you released when you were incredibly young? Yeah, I mean, I I think I can say that, that in terms of the energy of that album, yes. I mean, even when compared with some of the new material we've got, it's very consistent. I do look back now through the prism of my 45 year old eyes and, you know, I can, I can see and feel our immaturity, I suppose, not in a negative way, but just, I see that we were, I can see that, that I, how young I was, I feel Mm. that in terms of the lyrics and just some choices, you know, that, that were choices that were made not wrongly, but by a younger person. So take me back 20 years or even further than 20 years. In fact, take me back to kind of the start of the band. So you and your brother, Chris, living in a yep. delightfully named village called Dingley Village. When did the idea that you wanted to make music first start to trickle into your head? I started playing guitar when I was when I was started high school in, in Australia. So that was about like 13 or something yeah. like that. And I, I don't know where this came from. I asked myself this actually because I don't know where those initial feelings came from like even just to be a singer, like, I don't know where that came from, the desire or the need or necessity, or whatever, to, to project my voice in that mm-hmm. way. But we, quite simply, we just started one summer. We all had instruments for the first time, and it was me and Cam, guitar player. Chris came actually later. I'd always had a desire to play music. Music was always a big part of my life growing up with my uncles on my mum's side, and my grandfather was a tenor, and he played piano accordion and, and violin, and there was just always music around, you know, and I always associated sort of happy memories with that as well, because they always came from places or moments of joy of family parties or functions yeah. and things. Like that. So it, it started there. And then, and then we just, I don't know where the urge or the arrogance came to try and write <laughs> my, <laughs> but it all happened very quickly. Like, I mean, I was attempting at least to write songs from day one. So, I mean, you know, all those songs on Get More. On the written at a very young age, like they were the first songs we ever wrote. I mean, as a band, like they were, I was, you know, 17 years old. Look what you've done. I think I was 17, mm. 17, 18, 19. Like that was the, you know, so super young. So a lot of singer songwriters, I guess, their motivation for writing music or being in a band can quite often be to deliver a message or to tell a story or something like that. It sounds like, and I guess this comes across in the album to a certain extent, it sounds like. For you, it was more about creating a feeling of being an entertainer, of 
making other people feel stuff rather than necessarily telling a story from your point of view. Yeah, absolutely right. It's not, it's, it's exactly what it is. It's about the energy and the, and the youthful exuberance and, and just the excitement of being alive. You know, it's not a rocket science. I want to talk to you about some of the early band names you rattled through. I always find this entertaining when you talk about the kind of names of bands they had before they became the band they became, because it's almost impossible to imagine bands performing under different names. So some of the ones that I found from my digging was Mojo Filter, High Fidelity, yep. Duosonic. Did they all ring a bell? Yeah, yeah. Well done. Three out of three. <laughs> yeah, nice. Can you imagine you would have had the same success with those names? Can you imagine looking at one of your records with get born by duosonic written on it maybe i mean i actually i was when i cringed when you were about to go down this path but um not as bad as i thought but jet we went with because at the time all bands had quite long names and with in especially in the 2000s with a the in front of it and we realized that if you had a like a very short word you know how they they have to blow up the font to make it match the space mm. So you always looked like we were the most important band on the bill, regardless of where we were. <laughs> it's a good theory. I like that one. Yeah. So we're going to fast forward a little bit. Um, and I want to talk about a little bit of fortune, I guess, in the moment that led up to the arrival of Get Born. So you were supporting the Specimens and there was a talent agent called Dave Powell there who was the sound engineer for that gig. He spotted oh. your potential playing at that gig, signed you up. Do you remember the conversation after that gig between the band and Dave? And did it feel like a real kind of we've arrived moment when you had that conversation? Well, to be honest, it was slightly different than that. Dave was the running the pub. He was the talent booker for that pub. and um, But he had a lot of context. So we approached him and said, hey, since you know more than we do, would you would you be interested in sort of helping us get to at least the next the next phase, which is, which is what he did. And then at the same time, our lawyer in melbourne i mean there was a buzz in melbourne already and we didn't know what to sort of do with it mm. so we asked some help from dave and our lawyer who'd also picked up on the buzz the, the first thing we did was it was an ep i don't even remember what it was called had four songs on it and um our lawyer started shopping that around through his contacts in the uk which is how enemy i pre presumably got hold of it and mm. and as they start making ridiculous claims like we're the greatest band in the world before we've even <laughs> arrived um, so that's kind of how that all kicked off. And then, I mean, this was a big, crazy period. We, again, we're still only 20 years old and we're in Melbourne. We're just still living in our parents' houses. And next thing we know, from one week to the next, we had representatives from every single record company in the world fly oh. to Sydney and were um, falling over themselves trying to sign us, which then led to us moving. So, yeah, that, that's how it – and then we – we ended up making a decision, and then before we knew it, we were off. We were in Los Angeles recording our first full-length, feature-length album. Well, that's it. You went to LA. You recorded in the famous Sunset Studios. Did that feel like a real kind of red carpet moment? Was it as showbiz and glitzy as it sounds? I mean, we were pretty cocky back then and very proud to be Australian in such a pompous place as LA. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so we... Um, we we're quite happy to take the piss out of a lot of things there and a lot of people and, and a lot of, you know, that LA world was very foreign to us, particularly back then. But we did feel like, wow, you know, we did not, I mean, this is, it was, it was, um, none of us expected to be, you know, making a, a full feature length album at the age of 20 with, um, signed to Electra Records out of New York. It was a wild ride and, and, you know, and, and just crazy things kept happening. Like we're, we're doing pre-production in a quite a average rehearsal studio in LA. And um, there's this band next door and they're very loud. And at some point they've started the, the producer mid sentence stops and he goes, Oh my God, he goes, can you, what is that band? Like this, they're like the worst kiss cover band I've ever heard. And it was kiss next door. It was actually <laughs> um, shit like that, that, you know, just only happens in LA. And, but those sorts of insane occurrences just kept happening and happening and happening and that's what our lives became you know, very very quickly you say you didn't expect to be making an album at the age of 20 when you stepped into sunset studios did you mm. have a clear idea of what that album was going to sound like did you know what you wanted to make absolutely i mean l let me say that again i didn't expect to be making an album at 20 in la signed to lecture i mean we would have always have done an album it just might not have had we might we might have had a slightly different budget but um, absolutely. In fact, the songs were 
were very finely tuned because we, we'd we been, I mean, it did all happen very quick in terms of the recognition or the, the, the ascent, sorry, but we'd been a band for a while and we, we'd been rehearsing, writing, honing our craft behind closed doors for years prior to that, you know, like two, three years. So the songs were finely tuned. The demos did not change that much from from the recordings. It's interesting you talk about it being a whirlwind and fairly quick because when I listen back to the album, I think there's two songs in the album particularly that kind of hint at the early frustrations of being a band and struggling to break through. So Roll Over DJ and Radio Song mm. both are about the struggles that will be common for most people in bands of getting radio play and right. trying to break through and getting attention. Were you writing those as it was it a typical case of write about what you know, or was that your rallying cry to other musicians kind of going, look, we can do it. You can get there too. I think we just, it was, I mean, the usual path for most Australian bands is you, um, you slog it out touring quite relentlessly around Australia because the, I mean, the, the distances are vast. There's not a lot of money. You're never going to become famous. This was the mindset of us certainly back then. Like the idea of an Australian brand, I mean, I know that they do, but, but it's like winning the lotto, you know? I'm going to ask you to pick a couple of highlights or stories from the album in a moment. If there's a particular part on the album that reminds you of something in the recording process, we can pick up that. It, it's up to you what we talk about. But first, there's a couple of things I want to pick out from the album. And one, we need to talk about the cough. Probably the most famous bodily function in music at the start of Are You Going to Be My Girl. Was that just one of those little accidents that happened in the studio and it kind of worked so it stayed in? Or was it something that you always intended to do in that record? Well, it's a bit of both, actually. So as I said before, we did an, we had an EP first, mm. and there was a version of I Get Me My Girl on that EP. It was called the Dirty Sweet EP, and that was just I just happened to cough. But we also were a fan of leaving little things like that in, which wasn't the current at the time. There's loads of little moments where you can hear little spills and noises or people talking. We that was the choice to keep that stuff in because it just I don't know we felt that it made it a bit more. It was reminding mm. the listeners real it's real people and it's not some overproduced nonsense that we're a bit more used to hearing at that time so it was something that happened that you kept in there wasn't like a hundred different takes of different coughs and you painted in the no, studio no. over which one do you use no it was just the cough that was on the demo but we became so attached to it when we re when we redid it for the album we thought the cough was missing so we we cut it and pasted it from that ep I remember at the time when Are You Gonna Be My Girl came out, there was a few suggestions that it had borrowed musically from Iggy Pop's Lust for Life. Now, I understand that's a, something you've actually spoken to Iggy Pop about in the past. What was his take on that? I mean, he just said it was a great song. I mean, you know, it absolutely sounds like Lust for Life, but I think that's a bit of a, it's, it's a bit of a lazy comparison to just end the conversation there because it actually goes back further and there's loads of, like, I mean, it's it's Motown. There's like, thousand songs that have that rhythm and that beat and you know i mean town called malice walking on sunshine even i mean there's 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 loads and i think we just added one more song to that mix of songs that um share that dna the other track i wanted to talk about before we go to your picks was cold hard bitch it was only when i came back to this album this week listening back through it and kind of picking some bits out of it i first realized what a mammoth tune it was but also i hadn't realized how much it kind of hinted at ACDC to me, yeah. who are obviously fellow Australians. Mm -hmm. Was it a bit of a nod to them when you pulled that together? Yeah, I mean, we were just, I mean, that's the thing about that album, you know, you, I think that the naivety of it is also the, the very thing that makes it so great. And our unabashedness in in wearing all of our influences on our sleeves is also part of its charm for, I mean, that's, that's one, that's the reason why some people hate it. It's also the reason why a lot of people love it. So it's just whatever camp you're from, I suppose. I mean, yeah, that song was like, I mean, we were just like, let's make a song that's like, if we could blend together ACDC and the Stones, you know, like we were just having fun being being 19 years old and, and writing great rock and roll songs. Was any of that part to the fact that halfway through making this album, you left Sunset Studios and you went on tour with the Rolling Stones, you supported them in Australia, which must have been, a, again, an incredible experience for a 20-year-old band. Did you bring stuff back from that tour and go, all right, well, they did this, we could maybe do a bit of that in this tune? I think we got one thing that, that taught us was stagecraft was was because we were in our infancy then and the idea did not, didn't even occur to us that once you're on stage, you might actually have to perform as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so definitely that and just the importance of projecting, not just as an entertainer, but sonically and, and, and even within the writing of the music as the venues got bigger, you know, like these sorts of things were, were, were what we took away from that. 
Right, so pick me a couple of highlights for you from this record, Nick. There can be moments, musical moments or memories that transport you back to the making of the album in 2003. What would you pick out from this album? Well, I remember, um, and this is a, another classic sort of only in LA situation where we were working on Come Round Again mm-hmm. and we were talking about having maybe some electric piano or some sort of piano in that song and what would that sound like and what would the... And Tay, Dave Sardi turned to me and he said, what are you, I don't know, what are you kind of imagining? And I said, oh, wouldn't it be great to have, I don't know, something sort of Bill and Billy Preston-esque would be fantastic. And he goes, let me make a call. And a half an hour later, Billy Preston turns up. Like no Billy Preston, not just, as much as being there working on those songs, just being in, in LA was was huge. I mean, just checking into our hotel with the day we arrived was massive. We'd been, you know, we'd been living with our parents before that. And then all of a sudden we're in and staying and it was the Highland Gardens Hotel in LA and it was where Janis Joplin passed away. So yeah, it, you know, just being there and part of the fabric of that city that's that has so much history and where so much of the things that we love were born was quite intoxicating. I also remember going to Guitar Center, which was because we'd all, you know, we'd we'd all had got money for the first time too. So before the album started, we we went to get some gear, and I I remember walking into this store and just thinking like it was I've never seen anything this big in my life. And I mean, we have obviously there's lots of guitar stores in in Melbourne or in Australia, but this was like it was ten times bigger than anything I'd ever seen, with thousands and thousands of the best and most incredible collection of guitars I'd ever seen in my life, and I gravitated towards a Gibson 335, which I purchased that day. And that was, became the, I think, I mean, I'm, I just, when we're rehearsing here in my house right now, and I, that's the guitar I'm still using today. So that, nice. that, and I, that's the guitar I used on basically everything on that album. Very nice. There's so many songs in this album now that I think have entered the public consciousness in a way that's come probably other than from the album. So Roll of a DJ, Are You Gonna, particularly they've been in ads, films, video games are you still finding people who are coming to jet as a new band 20 years on via those alternative routes well i mean this is new to us because we've not been an active band for such a long time having just completed our first tours in um you know in over a decade yeah in australia we were very surprised to see that the audience was um i mean that the audience was so and the thing about jet is that even from the beginning there's something about what we did and do that it, it seems to cross many generations. I mean, even from the very, very first days, guys would go with their dad, you know, like it was, mm. it was really multi-generational in, an, in a nice way. And that's still happening today. Like it's, you know, the, the half the audience were, um, I mean, Jesus is probably not even born. As you mentioned, first tour in over a decade, you're back on the road, you're making new music as well. First new music in 15 years. Yeah. What, has, what has sparked this? What has sparked the resurrection of Jet? I don't know. It's just certain moments in a, in my life or in the life in the in the life of the band where things just sort of seem to line up in a way that feels like perhaps the universe is trying to tell you something that you should listen to. And and this felt like one of those moments again. And you know, it was the 20th anniversary. Everyone was in reasonably good place personally, and we got inducted into the Hall of Fame in Australia. We just got a random reach request from from Beyonce's producer of all people who said if there's an expression of interest in working with us, and we we're like all these things, you know, they just mm. sort of it just felt like all right, if we're ever going to, I mean, time's also running away too. So if there was a moment, this would be this would be it, you know. So we just sort of went for it tentatively, and then it grew and developed, and um, and we're still kind of trying to work it all out. But in the meantime, we've got um, yeah, we've got a lot of new fantastic songs that we're trying to finish off and we'll have something out next year for sure. Does it feel different now? Because to me, what I've heard, it still sounds like Jet, it's rock and roll, it's got that funk to it that you had on the first album and you've had running through your work since. But inside the camp, when you're there, like you say, 20 years on with the lads you made the music with originally, does it feel different writing and playing together? Not really, you know, it's weird. It's a weird thing and maybe it's just because of the, the amount of time that we all shared together and the in, and the intensity of it all whenever we kind of get back together it's i mean even like i don't even i don't in the same way that i don't really need to practice the songs there's so 
I mean, we did them so much. We played them so many times. They're just forever ingrained on in my on my bones. You know, like I don't, mm. and it's like that with with Chet as well. It's like a, it's like putting an putting an old jacket back on again. Looking back at the album, now you're coming at it and you're playing the songs live again. Do you look back at it and go, I would have done that differently. I would have changed that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, certain lyrics that I'm, I wince now when I sing them. <laughs> um, a couple of things, actually, was we'd just been rehearsing just then and I, I was just like, oh, I would have tightened that up a little bit now, like mm. the little, little things that maybe structure-wise or, but definitely I think I think lyrics sound like, um, you know, I don't know have an issue with them per se but it certainly wouldn't be how i approached it as a 45 year old interestingly is that one of the lyrics things i know there was a lyric change in are you going to be my girl and it was originally she's just like every other girl but it, you want to yeah, make yeah. It feel more positive is that one you'd reverse on i wouldn't change a single lyric in are you going to be my girl i think that one but on i mean cold hard bitch there's some there's some there's some stupid lines in there that um <laughs> That irked me a little bit now as an old, you know, not, not a big deal or anything, but I certainly, that song, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, what were we, what the hell were we doing? I think you'd upset a lot of people if you changed anything. Nick, lovely to speak to you. Good luck with the 20th anniversary tour. Really looking forward to hearing the new music when it came and really enjoyed chatting to you about the classic album that is Get Born. Thank you so much for your time on the Excess Long Player. You're welcome. Have a great day. Access Manchester Long Player, an iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Access Manchester. Wow, well, good one, it. Nick Sester from Jet talking about Get Born. If you enjoyed that, there is plenty in the back catalogue to get stuck into. To name just a few of the albums featured recently, James and Laid, Glas Vegas, Glas Vegas. That's a really good one. I talk about a couple of Oasis albums in this series. Dove's the last broadcast. There is absolutely loads of brilliant chats with people who made some of the best albums of our generation. Go back and have a listen. And make sure you're following this podcast because I know I've been on a hiatus. I know I've been away for a while, but I've got a couple of these in the bag. So there is more to come very soon. So hopefully I'll see you then. Manchester's indie rock and roll station. Access Manchester.